Last week, I began an exploration of the vital topic of refuge, and you can listen to the recording of that talk if you like. A refuge is anything that protects us, nourishes us, and inspires us, which is important at any time, but especially a turbulent and uncertain and difficult time like the one we're living in now. Refuges include many, many things. I think back as a kid playing hide-and-go-seek, the refuge of making it back to base. Um, when I was a kid also, refuges for me that were important were reading, especially science fiction, and also going outdoors into the orange groves and then the hills around our home in Southern California. Um, you know, refuges include places like a comfortable chair, you know, a park or a church or temple. They include other people pets, and other aspects of nature. Refuges include activities such as meditating or making music or art, and they include ideas and science and wisdom. Uh, I'm going to be exploring refuges tonight as I did last week and also in the weeks to come, especially in terms of the embodiment, the internalization of the felt sense of refuge so that increasingly we take our refuges with us in our own heart, wherever we go. Um, for many people, refuges certainly include spiritual matters, uh, although people can certainly operate in an entirely secular frame. Uh, in Buddhism, there are the classic three refuges that I spoke of last week, which we can generalize outside of Buddhism. The refuges, pardon me, the refuges of the teacher, the teachings, and the community of the taught. I'm going to continue on the topic of refuge over the next couple of months, weaving together what we are learning in modern neuropsychology about the embodiment of refuge inside ourselves. And I'm going to be integrating that and weaving that together with the perennial wisdom of the Buddha. Last point, we are not physically together, obviously. We're not in the same room, and that is a real loss. I think of this time as one of loss, and gain and recognition of what can never be lost and can only be found, such as the inherently good nature in every being. Uh, it's a real loss. On the other hand, there's the possibility to right now have 487 people um, present with each other here, as well as the, an awareness of, of others beyond even that number. And if we are to practice together and practice for the sake of each other, and practice in relationship with each other, and practice uh, supported by each other, in good company with each other. It's particularly important these days to draw on our very human capacities, which we share certainly to some extent with other animals, but are really developed in human beings, our capacities for, for empathy and empathic imagination, and getting a sense of who are these beings whose names we may see, Ilana, David, Kim, Ken, we may see faces as we scroll through the Zoom screens. These are people who are with us together right now. And we can, you know, encourage ourselves to widen our heart, to widen our empathy and our sense of what's called intersubjectivity in developmental psychology, the, the, the sense that there are other beings behind those eyes or behind those names or little you know, thumbnails of Zoom. There are other bleeding hearts. There are other longing hearts and um, you know, wishes to not suffer and wishes to awaken in, in other people. So we can, we can emphasize that, that here as we practice together. And now I'd like to turn to my primary presentation. So uh, each week I like to organize my talk around a particular quotation uh, which has been sent out to you in the reminder email uh, for this uh, meeting and we'll have another quotation for next week. Um, the quotation this week is, calm is one's thought, calm one's speech, calm one's deed. So right there, we have thoughts, words, and deeds. Calm is one's thought, calm is one's speech, and calm is one's deed, who, truly knowing, is wholly freed, perfectly tranquil and wise. So in that quotation, we have 
a positive cycle of the ways in which calming, genuine calming, supports true knowing, deep insight, deep wisdom. Calm supports liberation, freedom in relationship to our circumstances and our experiences. Calm supports perfect tranquility and the ultimate wisdom. And in a positive cycle, that quality of insight and knowing, that sense of uh, freedom in our relationship to our experiences and that growing tranquility and wisdom also supports calm in a wonderful positive cycle. So um, uh, as, a, as a way of kind of entering into this topic, I'm reminded of a movie I saw recently, which you may have seen, called, I think it's called The Great Fourteenth, about the Dalai Lama and his life. And I highly recommend finding a way to, seeing it, to see it. It was enormously moving uh, for me personally and my wife when we got to watch it online. Uh, you might want to buy it or see it in a theater, however you can. The Great Fourteenth. He is the Fourteenth Dalai Lama. That's what it means. And it's very much about his own life, his own journey. There's a lot of archival footage in black and white of his time in early Tibet. It's really interesting. And he's extremely candid about his own nature and his own reactions to things and his own practice. And uh, in his uh, wonderful, very, very direct, down-to-earth, uh, noble kind of way, um, he said the most important things, for himself at least, in his practice, are calm and compassion. And he really emphasized, it was interesting, he really emphasized uh, the importance of an inner calm, as he says, a genuine inner calm, uh, an inner stability, you know, an inner peace, even stillness. And you may have heard me uh, quote from the Buddhism description of his approach. I kind of think of it as his run-up to enlightenment uh, when he was talking about what, it w what was happening for him in his own practice. Uh, and he said that very, very painful feelings could arise, but they did not penetrate. They did not invade my mind and remain. All right? So you may hear outside my window the birds as well as the barking dog and it might be a little interrupting, it might be a little unpleasant, or it might be pleasant, but in either way, it does not have to disturb one way or another, pleasant or unpleasant, heartfelt or neutral, need not invade the mind and remain and disturb our, a, a fundamental inner peace and stability, even stillness, deep down inside ourselves. That's the realistic possibility. Of course, it's easier to be in touch with calm when the body and mind are relatively quiet. That's one reason why I think it's so important to establish a, a meaningful refuge each day of at least a minute or even less, at least a breath where you just land and come home and let the madness Disengage from the madness, disengage from the war, just whew, in whatever way is real, for at least a minute or so a day. Let the heart rate slow, let the exhalations be longer and deeper, slow it down. It's so important to give ourselves that experience every day so that we know what it's like. And as we come together once a week, and I hope you will keep coming together once a week for this. Um, we set aside a special time where we know what it's like to let the sediments in the pond of the mind settle so that the water that was always already clear and pure and innocent and awake can be really, really, really apparent. It's so good to set aside that time. That said, we're busy people. Most of us, we're, we're engaged in fully in life. And certainly there's a valuing of tranquility, equanimity, dispassion in all the spiritual traditions, including in those of the indigenous first people around the world. But this valuing of calming for its benefits does not mean numbing ourselves or denying healthy passion. Even when we are active, perhaps fiery and intense when dealing with injustice, or goofing around with friends, or cheering our children on. We can stay in touch with an underlying calm and clarity in the core of our being. 
In terms of the body-mind, and I'm speaking here as a psychologist, certainly, calm is very, very beneficial. It buffers us against stressors so they don't penetrate and upset and disturb us. And inner calm, which we can gradually develop as a trait, shores up the immune system. It protects the heart. It protects digestion, the gastrointestinal system. And traits of calm promote a longer and healthier life. It's not a guarantee, but it's part of a best odds strategy for a long and healthy life to disengage from habits of stressful agitation saturated with negative emotions, which have at this point an extremely well established in scientific research uh, basis for their, their negative impacts on long-term health and, and longevity. It, it's really useful for physical health. And psychologically, wow, most of the mistakes I've ever made in my life have involved some kind of loss of inner calm or lack of being in touch with inner calm. Uh, developing greater calm helps us to keep our cool when others heat up. It makes us more resilient and more able to recover from painful experiences and find our footing again and keep on coping and keep on going in the pursuit of our dreams. There have been times in my life when I've been in very, very challenging situations, sometimes at mortal risk to my body out in wilderness, sometimes with other people, sometimes just the long slog of being in graduate school day after day with two young children as the sole provider of my family. You know, uh, a slog, right? We make efforts, the, <laughs> there's some sweat on the brow, but deep, deep down inside, it's so helpful to stay in touch with a fundamental kind of inner peace and to be able to stay in touch with it, you know, when other people are heating up and getting agitated and you're getting triggered and you want to go there, whew, the development of traits of calm are so helpful, as we all know, I think, uh, when that, you know, when the oatmeal really starts to hit the fan. Neurologically and physiologically, calm is fostered in a variety of ways through improved structure and function in uh, multiple aspects, multiple parts of the nervous system. As kind of a bit of a list here, and fear not, there will be no midterm, uh, there will be no test on any of this material, and you can go back and listen to it later. Um, the development of traits of calm uh, involve and include reduced activity of a part of the brain called the amygdala. Technically, there are two, one on either side of the brain. Um, and it's kind of the alarm bell of the brain. It's continually tracking the hedonic tones of experiences in traditional Buddhist translations called the feeling tones of experience. A pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and I would add, increasingly for us humans, relational as well. So the amygdala is tracking that, and especially if it's unpleasant, you know, it starts going. Well, as we develop traits of calm, studies show there's reduced reactivity of the amygdala, and actually it becomes increasingly uh, reactive in good ways to pleasant experiences or opportunities rather than threats. There can be the development in the amygdala of more of an orientation toward promoting the good, not just preventing the bad, as important as that is. Um, there's a term used in a, the title of a research paper called the joyful amygdala, and I, uh, you know, freelanced a bit with that topic territory, and I, I can refer to a grouchy amygdala too. Well, as people develop greater traits of calm, literally, amygdala reactivity shifts and can shift from more of a grouchy amygdala to more of a joyful one. Obviously, I'm being poetic and metaphorical with my language here. Another thing that happens in the brain as people develop greater traits of calm is that their hippocampus um, becomes, that's another nearby part of the brain, the hippocampus improves its function and literally it develops structure, including through things like regular practices of mindfulness. And that's useful because the hippocampus has multiple key functions, including putting things in context, that helps us stay calm. Also, the amygdala, pardon me, the hippocampus inhibits the amygdala, kind of puts the brakes on the amygdala. Calm down, amygdala. Be more joyful, less grumpy. 
you know, right? And the hippocampus helps in that regard. Uh, and the hippocampus also signals another key part of the brain, the hypothalamus, a very ancient and important part of the brain that signals the pituitary gland to signal the adrenal glands to release stress hormones. And the hippocampus signals the hypothalamus enough stress hormones already. No moss, enough. It's okay. Chill out. That's why it's good to support the function of the hippocampus, which is one of the factors of greater traits of calm. You also see with people who are calmer, less resting state uh, stress hormones uh, that can be measured in a variety of ways, including through salivary uh, cortisol assays, less resting adrenaline, uh, also improved what's called heart rate variability. This is the normal uh, variation in uh, heart rate as it accelerates and then slows, speeds up and slows. Um, it's good to have good slowing in the heart rate as we exhale, which is a marker of heart rate variability and improved function of a part of the brain or part of the nervous system that I'm going to explore with you in practical ways momentarily, the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. And there are um, apps you can buy, like the Inner Balance app from HeartMath. Uh, this is, you know, I get no money for this. Uh, you know, we have them in our home and we find them really quite useful. Uh, Inner Balance, there are others from other sources that track your heart rate and you can actually train with them as a biofeedback device to develop greater heart rate variability, which other studies show. Um, is associated with improved immune, fiction, immune function and uh, is a marker for greater resilience in general. Another thing that happens as people get calmer is they have improved function right behind their forehead in the prefrontal regions that are sort of the seat of the executive functions in the brain, kind of top-down regulation of ourselves in a way that's beneficial, such as kind of talking ourselves off the ledge, uh, reminding ourselves that huh, actually whatever happened on the yuck scale is just a two and it doesn't really calm for an eight on the uh, getting upset scale. It's just a two. Uh, I try to remember sometimes or imagine that there's a video camera in the corner of the room recording what I'm saying or the tone I'm using and the recording will be played for the board of psychology or <laughs> at my kid's wedding if they ever finally get married. Anyway, um, it's, it has a kind of a calming effect on me at least. Uh, so, you know, that's part of prefrontal, prefrontal function, you know, just literally as a detail, naming the experience we're having, just not trying to change it, naming it. Whoa, getting really angry. Whoa, worried. Whoa, sad. Whoa, ugh, shocked and frozen. Ugh. Just naming our experience engages verbal centers for most people on the left side of the brain, right-handed people. Um, and also, um, as we name our experience, you know the saying, name it to tame it. I think Dan Siegel maybe came up with that one or perhaps somebody else, I don't know. Anyway, as we name it to tame it, there's increased activity, research shows, in prefrontal regions of the brain and decreased activity in that um, alarm bell, the amygdala. That's an example of improved prefrontal executive functions. Um, also, interestingly, and this is something that I've been exploring and did explore a lot in my new book, Neurodharma, um, Research shows that as we reduce activity in the default mode network, which is in the midline of the brain and then spreading to the side, uh, we are less likely to engage in negative rumination with a sense of self-preoccupation, helpless anger, helpless worry, resentments, regrets, um, you know, the kind of major basis for that kind of activity, which is not calm and erodes resilience and heightens overreactivity, the basis for negative rumination is in the default mode network. So one thing that happens is people de develop greater traits of calm, there's less default mode activity and there's less negative rumination and they're therefore more in the present, 
less mental time travel into the future and the past, and less self-preoccupations. That's another neurological circuit-based uh, change of structure and function um, that um, supports uh, traits of calm. Uh, a couple others as I finish here, and remember, you don't need to remember all these, but it's really kind of helpful to appreciate so many different ways, so many different circuits, so many different levers, so many different buttons, metaphorically, that we can push to help ourselves. Uh, so many things we can kind of nudge to a better place. Uh, just naming two more to add to my list here of the underlying physiological, embodied, neurobiological basis for calm. Um, increased oxytocin activity related to positive relationship experiences. As we feel more connected with others, uh, and oxytocin is the neurochemical, it's a hormone when it's outside the nervous system, uh, but it's the same chemical. Uh, oxytocin tracks re positive relationship experiences, and as we feel more connected to others, caring, flowing out, compassion, kindness, love for them, perhaps a commitment to their welfare, commitment to social justice, and as caring flows in, we feel more included, seen, appreciated, liked, and loved. Um, <clears throat> as that occurs, research shows that uh, anxiety decreases due to increased prefrontal activity and decreased amygdala activity, because the amygdala has receptors for oxytocin, which have an inhibitory effect. So as there are, are increased flows of that neurochemical oxytocin, as we feel positively connected with others, then the amygdala gets calmer and less reactive, and that alarm bell is less sensitive and doesn't ring so loudly. Last, uh, calm is supported uh, in, in by uh, natural opioids and re other related neurochemical uh, factors and, and processes that support positive emotions and contentment. Um, true calm has contentment and well-being woven into it. If we are suppressed and numb and frozen, that's not true calm in the sense that I mean it here. Um, true calm supports positive emotions of peacefulness and a fundamental sense of all rightness. Uh, and also that positively, emotion, the emotionally positive sense of gratitude, gladness, easing, and contentment also supports the sense of calm. Okay. So as I've said, you don't need to remember all of these. The good news is there are many ways we can help ourselves feel calmer in the moment. And then once those neurons are firing together, we can help them to wire together to develop traits of calm. We're moving from states of calm to traits of calm, or states of factors of calm to traits of those factors, and traits of calm altogether, altogether hardwired into our own brain. Um, that's really, really good news. And then as we develop traits of calm, those foster states of calm and calm very broadly defined in the ways that I'm talking about it here and related factors, which then, once our traits foster states of calm, that's another opportunity to rewire them and wire them into ourselves um, and reinforce them in ourselves in a wonderful positive cycle. So I'd like to introduce three sources of calm tonight and just name them and connect them to three broad Buddhist themes and then open it up for questions and comments, which I'll respond to. So major way you can help yourself to develop greater calm, and I encourage you to practice with this, even right now, tonight, and also practice with this in general, is to encourage greater activation, or it's called greater tone, in the parasympathetic branch of your nervous system. And one wonderful, simple way to do that is to exhale. Because as we exhale, the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system is engaged. When we inhale, the sympathetic branch of the nervous system is engaged, which both helps us be passionate in healthy ways, and also the sympathetic branch is very involved in the stress response of fighting and fleeing. 
uh, excessive parasympathetic activation is involved with freezing. So balance is, of course, everything, but if you, like me, are in sympathetic overdrive much of the time, it's really good to work that parasympathetic muscle. And a major way to do that is to deliberately exhale, take a few breaths in which your exhalation is as long as or longer than your inhalation, and more generally help your body to ease and relax and calm. There's what Herbert Benson and others have developed in terms of the so-called relaxation response. Training in resting state relaxation and calm is really good because then if you're disturbed from that resting state by something, you can recover and return to it more quickly. A second major thing to practice with, which I'll explore more in the weeks to come, is the profound practice of noticing when you're basically all right, right now, in the present. Only if it's authentic, right? If we're not basically all right, we're not. But if we're basically all right, if the body has enough air to breathe, if we're not starving, if we're not in great pain, if we have not suffered a terrible loss, if we're basically all right, we're not being attacked in the moment, whatever the future may bring, why not appreciate that? Why not rest in the present of all rightness and help ourselves really feel it? Also, a third and very important theme that I'll be developing in future meetings here is to get in touch with the inner knowing, the innermost knowing in your inner temple of what's actually true. This is the inner teacher, the inner knower that has a kind of stillness in it, a serenity, and a wisdom, there's something calming in finding refuge in what we know is fundamentally true. There's the deepest knowings of all about ultimate reality. There are knowings that are, you know, a little more kind of intermediate about uh, our own good nature and what's actually the case around us and what causes suffering and what causes happiness. And there's the knowing of particular situations we're in. You know, can we really trust another person? Um, can we really reliably get what we want from them? Or perhaps we need to really face the facts of, you know, and be in reality about what's really true. Or perhaps we can really see that, you know, we could be more open. We could be more expressed. We could, you know, dare more greatly, as Brene Brown puts it. So that inner knowing, that inner wisdom. And this is a way for me to make a final point here before I open it up for discussion uh, in response to questions. Um, it's that uh, this inner knower could be, you know, akin to one of the major three jewels in the Buddhist tradition of what's called the teacher or the knower, Buddha. The root of the word Buddha is simply one who knows or knowing. The Siddhartha, the individual Shakyamuni, his given name, was known as the Buddha as simply the one who knows. And that knowing, as he was first and foremost to teach, is not restricted to him alone. That knowing, that capacity to know, is inherent in all of us. In that sense, we all have Buddha nature in the core of our being, that fundamental capacity to know. In the same way, I'm going to be exploring the intersection, the connection of the classic three refuges in Buddhism of the teacher, the teaching, and the taught. And I'm going to relate those to the feeling of the, of the meeting and the fulfillment of our major needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection, which fosters an authentic sense of peace, contentment, and love. And I think the integration, you know, exploring an integration of the three jewels of the teacher, the teaching, and the taught, and connecting that with the three great refuges in the green zone, if you will, of peace, contentment, and love, loosely related to the three-stage evolution of our own brain, is going to be a very interesting exploration. Okay. So I thank you 
for uh, bearing with me in my, um, you know, kind of full speed exploration here. Uh, you know, often I, I, I teach maybe in a less dense sort of way, but I really wanted to kind of bring it home tonight. And also as a form of respect for the many people who are joining us, you know, out of respect for you, uh, I really wanted to deliver the goods tonight. And I hope it's not been overwhelming. Okie doke. So I'm going to scan through the chats that have come in. And um, I'm also going to try to take a question orally from someone. I've gone slightly long. Normally, I'll leave more time for discussion. And I'll particularly do that next week and make sure we have probably at least 20 minutes for discussion here. So um, just scanning here. Um, if you want to raise your hand for me to call on you. Um, you can push the little button in your window that raises a hand. Uh, if I don't call on you, it's not personal. Uh, I'm just kind of scanning through a lot of faces and kind of going with my instinct here. And with regard to now a question or comment that has um, come in, why not go for it? So Ron, Ron has asked a question here and you can see it in the chat. Buddhism seems to deny the transpersonal. I find my basic calm in the transpersonal. Can you expand, expound on where you stand and where Buddhism stands, re the transpersonal? Okay, I like, I appreciate the way you, you put that, Ron. So, by transpersonal, for me, what's meaningful about that word is to distinguish between that which is within the ordinary Big Bang universe which includes all kinds of stuff, including subtle energies and forms of relationship and interactivity that science does not yet fully understand. And the Big Bang universe includes things that science can never prove or disprove, and yet they still exist. You know, if you love someone, no researcher can prove that. If you hate someone, no researcher can prove that. That's an internal experience that you have. So, um, and the transpersonal, therefore, for me, points to something which is supernatural, such as rebirth or discarnate beings or different realms of reality. And also the transpersonal points to ultimately the divine, the ground, the ultimate, what I call the transcendental God in a word or bone by no name at all. For me, uh, ultimate reality does include transpersonal factors, transcendental. I don't preach that or push that. It's a controversial topic. A lot of harm has been done in the name of the transcendental in human history. And so I think it's important to be particularly careful about that. On the other hand, yeah, you betcha. Uh, explore that cl very clearly in the seventh practice of timelessness, finding timelessness in my book, Neurodharma. You can also check out the online program that explores that. It's really powerful material. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to stay entirely inside the secular frame of ordinary Big Bang reality, perfectly good. As to whether the Buddha or, or Buddhism, broadly, pointed to the transpersonal, people disagree. Uh, I think a fair interpretation of the teachings of the Buddha is that when he spoke of the unconditioned, he was speaking of something that was ultimately transcendental. He also very clearly and matter-of-factly talked about rebirth, devas, spirits in the forests, um, supernatural factors, and so forth. So I think that's clear in the early teachings of the Buddha, and it's also quite developed in Tibetan Buddhism. And you can find it implicit, maybe, you know, it's a little more riddling and obscure in, in Zen. Uh, you find certainly supernatural forces very present in Pure Land Buddhism, which I think is the fourth major evolution of Buddhism since the Buddha himself taught. Um, and as with everything, see for yourself. What are your refuges, uh, and are they working for you? Uh, and, you're, and are you also taking care of reality, you know, down here on planet Earth? Okay, so let's see. Is there, I'm going to bounce around. I see that Sally Swope has a hand raised. Okay, Sally, you were brave enough to put your hand up from the very beginning. I'm going to unmute you. Are you there, Sally? I can't see you. Did you raise your hand inadvertently? Sally? No? For some reason, I'm unable to unmute you. Tom, I don't know if you can... Well, maybe you, maybe you have kept yourself muted, Sally. Okay, so 
I'm going to leave you muted. I'm going to see if anybody else has a question, and you can just wave at me. Uh, I try to call on as, you know, just different people from time to time. Anybody have anything to say? Jack Zafros? Yay, excellent. I'm going to unmute you, Zach. Jack, can you unmute yourself too? I'm unmuting you. Tom, can you unmute Jack? And we'll figure this out next time. This is strange. Okay, Jack. Got it. Yeah, I, yeah. I do. Okay. My question is, how uh, does one decipher between the or knower? For instance, I'm in a situation where something is feeling uncomfortable. Yeah. In a group or something. So how do you wonder between the inner and more or just old prejudice coming up again? Let me say it back to you, Jack, just because the sound broke up a little bit to make sure I understand it. Are you saying how do we differentiate between the inner knower, you know, the that deep voice of true wisdom from other voices inside our own minds, as it were, including the seeker who wants to make things better endlessly? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, kind of, but uh, in the situation where you mentioned about the inner knowing, knowing about trusting, and you know that sort of thing. Yeah. So my question is, how would I or any uh, life between when it's coming come in the inner knower, or whether just coming from an old trace? Yes, that's a deep, deep question. Um, so, a couple things here. In terms of what the Buddha offered, he was, as best we gather from the surviving written record, which was eventually written, put down um, a few centuries after he passed away. He was very practical and discerning, and he encouraged people to be discerning and to observe over time. To observe over time what is conducive for happiness and welfare and what causes suffering and harm. He encouraged people to study and observe and see. Kick the tires, in other words. Um, that's how he advised his own son Famously, Rahula is his son. He said, before doing something, while doing it, and after doing it, reflect. Is it beneficial or not? If it's beneficial, good. If it's, if it's harmful, don't do it. So there's no replacement for that kind of discernment, first. Second, with practice, in my experience, we start to get in touch with the somatic markers, the felt sense of different perspectives inside us, different voices inside us. And uh, with time, we start to become aware of the somatic qualities, even the, the sensation qualities, the tension patterns in our own body of when, you know, there's a point of view in us that may well be well-intended. Often the, these points of view, these subpersonalities are well-intended in their way, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> their effect may not be beneficial. And so we can have a sense of a voice or perspective that's like a pushy one or a driven one or feels like the internalization of people who were critical of us previously in our life or a tricky one. You know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they'll talk about the addict voice, the inner trickster who's telling us, oh, don't worry, you can get away with this just one more time, things like that. And on the other hand, we start to have a f feeling for, um, you know, th that deep inner knower, like the, what's the still small voice? I think the poet called it the still small voice or the better angels of our nature. And we start to have a feeling for its qualities. And I, I can just say for myself, um, you know, often there's a softness in it. Uh, there can be a simplicity it, it feels almost impersonal. This goes perhaps to a, it, its potentially transpersonal aspects. I mean, there have been times in my life when a voice of wisdom came in that did not feel at all my own. And it saved my life, honestly, when I was nearly drowning, uh, when I was drowning actually at one time, and trapped in kelp when I was 16. So 
you know, it has those qualities to it. Um, you know, there can be, it doesn't feel contracted. It doesn't, there's a kind of dispassion in it almost. It's like, it's not quite, but it, it's as if it doesn't care what you do. In, in a sense, it cares what you do, but it's not trying to talk you into it. It's not haranguing you. It's just, it's the truth of things. And, you know, maybe there's a softening in us. Maybe there's a heart. And often last, um, I think our inner voice speaks to us, this deep knowing beyond words. Maybe with art or image or imagination. Uh, one thing I, I want to explore more with you all this year is nonverbal practice. It's going to be interesting to use words to point to what is beyond words or distinct from words, but we're going to be exploring that. I think that's very rich territory. Art, fable, imagination, imagery, sensation, uh, movement. You know, this is very, very, very rich. So maybe I'll just leave it there. Actually, one last thing I'll just say. I think it's also helpful, Jack, it's really true for me, and uh, to turn to those who clearly seem to live in that wisdom very fully and feel their transmission even that comes through their words. You see it in their face. Uh, you can somehow feel it from them and turn to them and be in their good company and to set aside a little time every day for study or reflection, uh, listen, you know, listening, uh, you know, um, there's a fundamental practice in Buddhism where we remember the Buddha. We, not in a worshipful sense, it's very important to distinguish this, but more to follow in the footsteps of the Buddha, right? And we can do it the same way. We open to the wisdom and the teaching of people who have stood the test of time, at least for us, you know, and then see what, what they might call us to. Great. So finishing here, these are all refuges. We can rest in refuge. We can feel it. We can be a refuge for others. I want to be very direct and honest here, you are a refuge for me. I see your faces. I don't I see the faces of everyone. Truly, we are refuges for each other. We can be a refuge for each other and um, practice together. And as I think Ramdas put it, walk each other home. <laughs>